Hi folks, this is Patrick Nury with Northwest Treasures and this is GeoTalks, these short little talks that are designed to give you a little bit more of a biblical picture of Earth history. Now today I am at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Now many people think that Yellowstone consists simply of a big massive volcanic explosion and that's about it and they appreciate the beauty in here, uh, of this place, but they don't really have a good composite picture of what happened here. So I'm gonna to try to give you that today. We are outside, so uh, and we've been getting some rain. There's a big cloud above us that seems to be dispersing, but for a while there, it looked like we were on Mount Sinai. And uh, that's not part of the geology here, but the rain would have definitely uh, forced us to change our days. So let me start with the area behind me. What you see back there, first of all, you see a, a dark area behind me up on the hill. That is basalt lava, and that is related to Yellowstone. Uh, also, immediately behind me, you see kind of a white line. Uh, it's been pretty much mined out, but that is travertine. This whole mountain I'm on right here is uh, a series of travertine flows or springs that used to be very active here. This is much like Mammoth Hot Springs today within Yellowstone Park boundaries. That rock is not a volcanic rock, it's a sedimentary chemical rock. And it is produced when hot acidic water comes up through limestone, dissolves the limestone. Then when it reaches the surface, something chemically happens. The water that's now filled with dissolved limestone precipitates. So the limestone comes out of the water and forms as a chemical sedimentary rock called travertine. It's a very pretty rock when it's active because now when it's active it shows all kinds of rainbow colors and those are the microbes that get involved in it. But here when you see it turn white or a light gray, then it's inactive, and that's what you have around here. Now, uh, kind of doing a, revolve, a revolving turn here, uh, you'll see the mountains immediately in front of us, and the set of mountains directly across the valley here, the darker ones, those are part of the Absaroka chain of volcanic mountains. Uh, this chain of mountains, erupted approximately 9,000 cubic miles of volcanic material. And there are a number of volcanic centers within those mountains, rifts, and uh, uh, volcanic activity. Now the Absaroka volcanic mountains are rather unique. In addition to producing a lot of darker lavas, it also is thoroughly saturated with petrified mud and uh, volcanic lava flows that have a lot of bits and pieces of volcanic rock mixed in it, so we call it a breccia. But in addition to that, it engulfed a lot of trees and plants, petrified trees and plants. The Absaroka chain of volcanic mountains here not like your Mount St. Helens. This would have included a lot of water. And uh, there's indications that Absaroka Mountains were erupted in water, uh, probably at the tail end of the flood. Now, the trees that are contained within the Absarokas are the most petrified trees of any place in the world. This is saturated with them. I have found significant uh, numbers of them within these lava flows. So it's not pure lava. It is a mixture of lava flows and muds and all kinds of things, but a very interesting story with that. Now, there's, there are some mountains then behind the Absaroka Mountains. Uh, over to the front of us, in the back of the Absarokas, you'll see kind of a light-colored set of mountains. The one, the highest one out there, is called Electric Peak. But those mountains are not volcanic. Those mountains are sedimentary. Now that should give us a clue as to how they were formed, at least from a biblical perspective. Sedimentary rocks are laid down by water and mud and then have petrified 
into some sort of uh, chemical sedimentary rock or clastic sedimentary rock of various kinds. So the question is, were these mountains here when the flood happened and uh, did they, were they all buried by the flood waters? Well, I don't think so. Uh, these mountains have undergone what we call in geology uplift. And according to our chronology, it would have been catastrophic uplift and rapid uplift. So toward the end of the flood, or about, well, let's start first of all halfway through the flood, about day 150, the entire earth that existed then was covered in sedimentary rock. And uh, about day 151, Psalm 104, 5 through 9 indicates that at God's rebuke, the waters fled. And then it does say, the mountains rose and the valleys sank down. Now, when those mountains rose, that created quite a bit of upheaval again in the earth, and you have a lot of volcanic eruption going on. Those mountains back there, Electric Peak, those would have raised, the water started coming off and uh, uh, took off a lot of the sedimentary rock, and, and uh, then, of course, in the midst of the water coverage, the Absarokas are, are uh, erupting. Uh, and then in the foreground of the Absarok, as you can see, some real hilly, hummocky surfaces, a lot, lot of bumps. And there's nothing really growing on them, and that's because these are all uh, a product of the ice event that would follow the, um, the end of the flood. Now, a lot of people mistake Yellowstone for one massive uh, eruption, but actually Yellowstone is a product of about three different huge catastrophic eruptions. We call them calderas. The last one is what's made Yellowstone so famous. Those calderas erupted a different kind of lava. It was lighter in color and filled with quartz. The Absarokas are, are much darker and they're filled with uh, lavas that are rich in iron and magnesium. So now you've got the Yellowstone caldera erupting. The flood waters have washed out the, the valleys here and have moved on. And uh, the ash is rising into the air and making a covering from the sun's reflective energy. The waters from the flood have been evaporating into a now a cooler atmosphere and lo and behold you've got a recipe for an ice event and that's where you've got a lot more snow coming down uh, and uh, staying uh, at a much more rapid pace than is melting so that snow is going to form huge amounts of drifts and piles and then that's going to freeze under the pressure and the weight forming glaciers now those glaciers covered most of Yellowstone and indeed around this area as well. And that relates to that hummocky surface I showed you back here. Uh, now, now that the volcanoes have started to settle down, the ash begins to clear, the sun's reflective energy comes out, and now you've got another catastrophe happening, and that is the rapid catastrophic melting of the ice sheets that were present, especially in Yellowstone. They produce a lot more flooding. So behind me is the uh, part of the lava flows of the Absarokas, and then in the foreground, uh, are the Travertine Terraces. I love coming to collect here because uh, it's on uh, public land and I can pick up all I need for my kits. And it's what makes my kits real special because now you got a little bit of the history of the area as well. Down below in the valley, way, way, way down there is the Yellowstone River. And uh, the Yellowstone River originates in southeastern Wyoming, progresses up through Lake Yellowstone and comes out again on Lake Yellowstone at the north and eventually coming up here through the north entrance of Yellowstone through the town of Gardner and into Montana and across Montana. Lots and lots of western history are associated with the Yellowstone. It's a beautiful river, lots of fishing taking place and of course lots of flooding if the conditions are right. The Yellowstone River is the longest undammed river 
in the United States. And consequently, when there is a lot of rain it can handle, then of course there's lots of flooding. And that's what happened to um, the town of Gardner here not so long ago. And so the north entrance to Yellowstone uh, is closed right now between Gardner and Yellowstone because the, uh, the Yellowstone River took out a lot of the roads that got you into the park. So you have to go around to other entrances. It has hurt the town of Gardner, but that's a part of the history that's here in the geological history as well. So that should give you a kind of a composite general view of the Yellowstone area, at least as it is in the north. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this little geo talk. Be sure to check out our website and the products that we have. We have the, I've written a book on the geology of Yellowstone and another one on national parks and geology, as well as some textbooks that'll help you work through what I just explained to you today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this has helped.